Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, let's get started. I will now turn the meeting over to tonight's moderator, Amy A. Hey, well, thank you, Chuck, and um, thank you, everyone, for letting me be of service tonight. My name's Amy, I'm an alcoholic, and um, I am, as uh, Chuck said, I am a GSR, or a general service rep for my home group, which is Keeping It Simple in Medford, and um, it's a two-year commitment. I'm almost at the one-and-a-half-year mark, and I've also been one of the committee members on the recently formed uh, District 16 Ad Hoc Committee for this COVID-19 that Chuck spoke about. So I'm familiar with the survey questions that were sent out to the GSRs. And um, and that's the basis of, of, of uh, the discussion that we're having tonight. So here's how it's going to happen. We're going to break the time that we have together to talk about th- six different topics. And we're going to call them hot topics because uh, according to the responses we got from the GSR survey, it showed that these were the areas that were needing attention. So we're going to focus the conversations there. And uh, we have six topics, okay? Um, I'm going to feel like Alex Trebek here. So the first topic is primary purpose and carrying the message. The second one is sponsorship. The third one is newcomers. The fourth one is access. The fifth is safety. And the sixth is self-supporting. And we're going to allocate about 15 minutes for each section. And um, so these are the topics, everyone in the audience. If you have questions, um, I've curated some questions from, again, from our GSRs, but please put questions that you have into the Ask It basket, and they'll get routed to me um, with these uh, different categories. So um, I wanted to um, let you know that I'll do my best to get them answered. And so, you know, it's a privilege to be able to moderate tonight's discussion because how we all as group members can uphold the 12 traditions during this new normal in AA. And, you know, none of us are in charge. All of us, you know, that are here, not just the panelists and our meet. We're not in charge. We're not gurus. There's no president of AA. We're just people with a drinking problem whose lives were changed by AA. And so we want to make sure that those who come after us are able to experience that same change. And so, you know, even during this new AA normal. And so, again, what Chuck said, tonight's objective for the panel is to give groups and members ideas and hope as to how they, too, can uphold the traditions now and beyond. And so we hope that you continue these conversations back at your groups after tonight. So, you know, um, I'm a little biased, but I think tonight's panelists are solid AA members. They're leaders in our local AA community, and I'm proud to call them all as friends. So I say this so that you panelists can feel like you're sitting in my living room in my couch, and we're just cozying up, and, you know, there's some people who happen to be peeping in the window and talk and listening in, but... Um, you know, I want this to feel like a really, you know, just a, an organic conversation. And uh, we're talking about our favorite topic, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know that you guys all feel that way. So um, let's meet tonight's panelists, shall we? Um, it's important for you guys to get to know who who's here. And um, so I'm going to ask the panelists to share their name, their sobriety date, their home group, and any other meetings that they've been regularly attending. Um, maybe before and after this COVID stuff that's been happening. And so um, and if you just give us a very brief overview of if the meeting, the meetings that you go to, if they're doing, if you're meeting in person, if they're doing video conferencing, if you're doing a conference call, or if it's canceled sort of till further notice. So we're going to do ladies first. And um, Fifi, if you can just do a quick, quick uh, intro. Hi, my name is Fifi. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Fifi. Uh, my home group is Hole in the Wall. And it is now in Zoom format, thanks to your service, Amy. We started out with a, a dial-in, which was kind of felt organic, and there were a lot of people who couldn't access it, they thought, through Zoom, but that was all worked out. So luckily we meet uh, Monday nights at 7 p.m. Um, in this format, and it's a fantastic meeting. There's a lot of newcomers, so I'm so happy that that's available to them and to, to everyone. Thanks, Sophie. So, and what's your sobriety day? Oh, February 23rd, 2010. Great. Thank you. Stacy. Um, hi. Good evening. My name is Stacy, and I am an alcoholic. Hey, hi, Stacey. everyone. Hi. Um, 
So uh, my sobriety date is June 3rd, 2014. My home group is the Crack of Dawn meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that meets from in, in Ashland uh, six days a week, Monday through Saturday from 7 a.m. till 8 a.m. And I, um, we are now just, uh, we are not meeting um, uh, in any meeting place. We are meeting video, video conference format is how we meet. And I also attend on Sunday the Ashland Sunday Morning Fellowship Meeting, which is also a video conference meeting. Great, so, Thank you. Thank you. Debbie. Hi, my name is Debbie, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Debbie. Um, nice to see all those friendly faces out there. Um, my sobriety date, date is January 4th, 1994. And um, before that, the COVID, COVID quarantine, my regular meeting was the Sunday night Jacksonville meeting. Um, because of changes at work um, that have been caused by the, the virus, um, my schedule has kind of been turned upside down. Um, and I haven't been able to get to that one very much. Um, so I'm doing a lot of different meetings that I haven't been to very much um, in the past, which has been kind of fun. Um, and trying to make the regular ones like my Monday night Medford meeting um, to see all those faces that I love when I can when work permits. Thanks, Debbie. Kelly. I'm Kelly. I'm an alcoholic. My hey, Kelly. Hey, August 29th, 2007. My home group is There Is a Solution, and we normally meet on Monday nights at 6.30, uh, 1900 Greenwood. Um, if anybody wants to come when we're back here, <laughs> please feel free to come. Thanks, Kelly. And Alan. Um, and I'm Alan Vines, and uh, my uh, sprite date is September 23rd, 1982. Uh, my home group is uh, Sunday night, how it works. We meet at 7 o'clock at Trinity Episcopal in Ashland. Um, I go occasionally to Crack of Dawn and Sunday morning Ashland Fellowship, and all of those are in Zoom format now. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Ryan. Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Ryan. Sobriety date is September 7th, 2017. Um, my home group is uh, Talent Phoenix Group as of right now, technically. Um, I've gotten the opportunity to start a meeting on Saturday, but I um, there was we only had two meetings. We hadn't even got a name yet or any of that. So that will be my new home group soon. Um, I do attend the Ashland Fellowship Group, the 9 a.m. In, in Ashland, um, the Tuesday and Thursday 8 o'clock group in Ashland as well. Um, Saturday, um, sometimes I attend the 99 and under, and Friday, stud month in the morning. Those are all video conference as of right now. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. And Sal, you're here. Yeah, my name is Sal, and I'm a alcoholic. Hey, Sal. Uh, my sobriety date is um, February 27th, 1977. I have 43 years of sobriety. My home is Alan Phoenix on Wednesday night. Uh, Dan is leading the online, Dan Fieldman is leading the online Zoom meeting on Wednesday night. It's got about maybe a third of the regular members attending the Zoom meeting. Uh, in my experience, that there's a lot of people out there uh, that just haven't, I was at a meet group, group, MD didn't have, uh, do Zoom, so that was interesting. Um, 
I go to about three or four Zoom meetings a week. Um, I don't particularly care for them. I, I do them because I need to keep my head on straight and keep connected with everybody, but I prefer to uh, uh, see y'all. I can't wait for we to get back together again. That's well, th thanks, Al. Garrison. Garrison, I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Garrison. Uh, the starting date is March 18th, 2017. My home group is the Ask Meeting. We meet uh, Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock. We'll resume. Um, these Zoom meetings have been great. I get to get all over the place to see all the people I've met over the last few years all over the country. Um, Mondays, I'm in Boise. Tuesday, I'm in Coquina uh, or Los Gatos. Uh, Wednesday, is, is usually the only local or only local Zoom meeting I've been doing. Uh, Thursday, uh, Knuckleheads in San Jose. Friday, um, Friday, there's something Friday. Uh, Grand Spa speaker meeting. Uh, Saturday, I meet with a closed a closed meeting with a group of friends called the Aloha Day. And Sunday, um, I actually do a a a closed a meeting with a group of young people in recovery uh, who are all members of like a, a Facebook meeting group. So uh, these are all done on Zoom. It's been a really cool experience. Great. Thanks, Garrison. Okay. So um, thank you guys so much for, you know, for being here tonight and uh, assisting us. And uh, everyone is going to get to know you guys a little bit better. And um, let's get started. So our first hot topic is primary purpose and hearing the message. And so um, we're going to dive right in, guys. And, um, you know, according to our fifth tradition, you know, it says each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. And yes, you know, there is a lot going on in the world right to now. There's, uh, you know, connected with our GSRs from the survey, and it seems that um, some AA members, new and old, uh, are being driven by a hundred forms of fear. It talks about in the big book. And, um, you know, some GSRs have said that uh, they're concerned that their meetings were no longer focused on the primary purpose. And so, you know, even one survey respondent wrote, my, the sharing in my group meetings seems to be turning into therapy sessions not focused on one primary purpose, not carrying this message. Okay, so this is um, what we're going to be talking about in this um, 12 minutes. So I'm going to set a timer here. Hang on. Um, hang on, hang on. So, um, you know, what, here are the questions. What is the AMA message from your experience? And what has the AA message, or has the AA message become diluted in your meetings that you go to? How so? How so? Or if not, why not? And the follow-up question with that is, what are we doing as individuals and as groups to carry the AA message and give experience strength comfort and hope to others inside the rooms, how are we helping them from getting unstuck from the problem? So um, let's see, let's start with, remember panelists, you can raise your hands if you're like chomping at the bit. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie, I heard you laugh. So Debbie, uh, can you start? Yeah. <laughs> did, that, did that laugh for me? I was chomping yeah. at the bit? Okay. I was chomping at the bit. That's a lot time you'll hear me laugh. Um, <laughs> Oh, actually, that's interesting because I I actually kind of found that to be true. I felt like it was true. Um, kind of at the beginning of the Zoom meetings, I think it, what it felt like is everybody was in a state of shock. Of, you know, our meetings are going away and, um, you know, our, our worlds have kind of been turned upside down. And at the beginning, it felt like some of the meetings that I was in were talking a lot about that, talking about um, all the, the changes that were happening in our society. But it feels to me like we, we kind of got traction again. Um, and I think that's, you know, understandable, but it, it took a while to find our way through something that was such a big change um, for the world. Um, and it felt like to me as the meetings, the individual meetings started picking up and they started 
started resuming their format that they had when they were in person, um, that we found traction again with that primary program. And, and people started having um, cheer people again and speakers. The, the, when, the, when the formats resemble the formats of the in-person meeting, it felt to me like we've we kind of came back around to that and uh, came back around to our primary purpose and to the, uh, the focus of what do we do about our alcoholism. Um, and that felt reassuring to me that no matter what our meeting was like, that we still have a solution to the problem of drinking. Um, and that was, that was comforting to see. So, thanks. Thanks, Debbie. Um, hey, Garrison, so if you can tell us a little bit about your experience, it looks like you're muted. Guys, can someone unmute Garrison? Panelists, if you mute yourselves, unfortunately, you can't unmute yourself, so you got to keep it muted, <laughs> unmuted. Okay, so Garrison, if you can um, respond um, with your experience, and then also, you know, in, in your um, experience, what is the AA message? Uh, Garrison Alcoholic, the AA message is message for both, and it's and um, I'm really glad that this is a topic that we have here um, because this is a topic that I'm very passionate about. It's one that I have seen um, plague this fellowship a long time before these, these Zoom meetings started. Um, with meetings turning into group therapy sessions or, or open discussion meetings about um, relationships or, or boundaries is a good one. Um, we're here to talk about recovery from alcoholism. You know, our, our literature promises promises us recovery, recovery from alcoholism, being recovered from the hopeless state of mind and body. And it is our job as recovered alcoholics to carry that message, that message of hope to the newcomer. Um, I was a little discouraged when we started these Zoom meetings um, about the lack of many people attending these meetings. But over the course of you know this last month, I've seen a lot of new people come in. Uh, I have uh, you know new sponsees in, in Portland, uh, Boise, San Clemente, I got a guy in Hawaii who, who come in and done this, and, and that is our message, we share a message of hope. So, I mean, our literature tells us that we're driven by a hundred forms of self-centered fear, and this has been a problem long before COVID-19, and so, while we're supposed to be talking about traditions, like this really comes down to us as individuals working strong programs, and being, and, and living, and showing that newcomer message of hope by our actions and our message, period. Um, and at, at the risk of getting up on a soapbox, I think I'll, I'll end it there. Thanks, Garrison. I appreciate it. Um, hey, so, um, Ryan, I'd like to ask you, how can we, you know, uh, one of the follow-up questions is, um, what can our group do, and what can we do as an individual to carry this message? Well, you know, it says the life of the fellowship depends on this principle. And, um, yeah, you know, for us that have had a spiritual awakening, um, uh, we get the opportunity to um, give some you know, somebody that our most precious thing, and that's our time. You know, all of us um, were given, were somebody had given us their time um, so we could have that process of the psychic change. Um, you know, on the note of, if, of the therapy session, you know, and, you know, that can, that, that can occur, you know, or, or the, the, you know, the meeting that goes off topic and, and you know, people start, you uh, one up in each other on, on battle wounds or, you know, drunk logs, um, you know, or whatever it may be. Um, there, there will be a moment where, you know, I feel like, um, or like my sponsor or some people that I decide to surround myself around may, who have may have a spiritual awakening or we use the group. Um, you know, like there are certain things that I've gone through and certain things my sponsor's gone through and, and some of my other trusted friends, you know, and we can, um, carry our message, you know, um, to that, to that topic or to that still suffering alcoholic, you know, whether they got the, whether they're new or they got, you know, a lot of time, you know, um, I think that answers your question. Yeah, no, that's,
that's great, Ryan. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, guys, there's no, there are no wrong answers. It's just our experience and what is our gut saying. So, uh, and anyone listening as well, I just want everyone to know that this is, this is just a fluid discussion. And um, so, thank you, Ryan. Sal, how, how do you think? Like, how can we, um, how can we, you know, again, the same question. How can we carry this message as a, how can as a group? We get like, how can we out to make sure that our group not is fulfilling it? Be contacted uh, and what can we do as individuals to help that as well? Um, my name is Sal, and I'm an alcoholic again. Um, uh, one of the things that I think our district is doing a fantastic job of our resources together and I saw the way that we, uh, our, our, our community came together and got them on board within a week we had a, a meetings on zoom and most people didn't even know what zoom was and people were getting trained pretty rapidly uh, Nick and uh, really did a fantastic job of sending me updates and uh, holding uh, meetings on how to get Zoom rolling in our community. So I think we are doing a lot. One of the things I think we don't understand, and I just sound bias, uh, but the influence of treatment programs have really altered the way we can carry the message. People that come to treatment centers are traumatized. You know, when I came into this program, I came in as an alcoholic. And that's all I had to worry about, you know. And getting a sponsor, I can get a lay sponsor because my, my problem was that with alcoholism. Uh, people that come out of treatment centers today have uh, four or five mental disorders attached to their alcoholism. And, and so sponsorship, I think, is really greatly altered because people come in and have treatment centers and don't think uh, a regular sponsor or AA can really help. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that if we're going to try to be more effective moving forward. Uh, I hope I'm not stepping No, no, this is great. This is great. I, I was a counselor for 12 years. And, uh, hey, Sal, I I'm going to, Sal, I don't know. Can, can someone mute Al? Like Sal, a, Sal uh, I'm, can someone mute him? So I don't think he can hear me. And, uh, Tech liaison, can you mute Sal, people, please? Uh, 12 staff. Okay. You know, our ability to carry the message to the public is still suffers. Is it's it's interesting. It says he's yeah. muted, but we can still hear him. So I'm not sure yeah, how that works. Really, the rest of his message. Can, uh, can someone can someone drop can someone drop Sal from? Just just drop him, and I'll I'll send him a text to log in again. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, guys. Let me just shoot him uh, um, a quick text. Let me finish that up. Um, okay. All right. So Sal will come back, you guys. He's a, he's a wealth of knowledge, but not in robot voice. So Stacy, can you bring us home? We had a question come in from the Ask It Basket, um, that asked, or that said, it seems to me that many meetings have become addictions anonymous. So can you talk a little bit about that? And we have a minute or 30 seconds. <laughs> if I get 30 seconds. Okay. So, so, um, I'm only going to share my experience, and that is how do I serve that primary purpose? How do I carry that message and stuff? And all of it's yes. Yes is that it can it the meetings can take their a, a diluted form. They can shift off a purpose and stuff. Myself as an individual, 
I do my best to translate my experience from the literature and relate it to understandable terms. I do my best to bring it back to, hey, is fear our problem? This is what I do. On this page, on page 68, it tells me that it guides me through this prayer that says that if I practice this, that um, I, I, that I will have a practicing a restorative faith that works from a God of my understanding, which will at once I will outgrow my fear. That's the statement of the book. And I do my best to try to transmit just my own personal experience uh, through the literature to be helpful, to carry the message. Because, yes, there is a way out. There is a way out. Okay, thank you, you, Stacey. Thank you so much. Okay, next hot topic, sponsorship. So we're going to expand on Tradition 5. Uh, which is, again, each group has what but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. And I'm going to take a moment to read an excerpt on page 23 in the uh, Q&As section about sponsorship. Um, pamphlet, it says, um, how does sponsorship help a group? The primary purpose of an AA group is to carry the message of this recovery program to alcoholics who want to ask for help. Group meetings are one way of doing this. Sponsorship is another. And in this pamphlet, it gives some examples of how groups can incorporate sponsorship into the meeting. And two, two that stood out to me and I want to share is one says regular assignment of members to greet newcomers at meetings and introduce them around. In large groups, people on a hospitality committee may wear badges for the benefit of the newcomer. In smaller groups, the secretary may, during the announcements, simply ask the newcomers to come up and make themselves known after the meeting so that they may be introduced to other members. Another suggested announcement, if anyone here does not have a sponsor and wants one, please see the secretary who will arrange for a temporary sponsor. Where this practice is followed at each meeting, members say it reminds the group of the value of sponsoring and being sponsored. So again, we're talking about sponsorship here, and, and, it, and it's, you know, from GSO, the General Service Office of New York, has, you know, uh, some stuff that says group meetings are one way to also carry the message outside of a, a you know, group. So um, it's interesting because in our GSR survey, it, it, it wasn't really addressed in any, any of the responses about sponsorship uh, in, in carrying the 12 traditions. And so, um, again, it doesn't mean that they necessarily uh, thought it was a problem, but it, was, it wasn't it was there. So, um, you know, we internally thought it would be a good opportunity to discuss sponsorship tonight, especially because, um, you know, there are some, you know, changes that have happened with social distancing, right? Like, so are there any procedures that you personally have um, – adjusted with uh, people that you sponsor or is there anything that your groups have in place um, either before COVID or now during this um, to uh, support sponsorship? So uh, Alan, I'd like you to please start. Okay. I want to go back to last topic though. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you do, but I, 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 I got you on sponsorship. Well, let me, let me do it the long way and you can do it. To me, what you did it sound. Hang on, I got to set the timer. I got to set the timer. But, you know, I think that the group's message starts with the first tradition is that we have to do it together and we can survive. The second tradition is our wisdom comes from the group, not from any individual. The fourth tradition says that each group's autonomous. And in our formats, when we start our meetings, we always read it, and there's a segment in there that says what the group wants you to do and how it wants you to share. And then the fifth tradition says its message. So the fifth tradition doesn't really say that it's it's an AA message. It says it's the group's message. Like our group is the How It Works meeting, and what we do is, is we have the chairperson read How It Works and pick a topic out of that chair and not necessarily tell their story. So that it's important for me when I go to other meetings that I uh, I respect that that request in that format and share along the guidelines that they have. Okay, that being said, is that I think sponsorship, the guys that I sponsor, I'm now talking to them on Zoom, which just started last week because I, I haven't seen them in a month. 
and that um, you know part of part of the way that I sponsor is that I also ask them to honor the traditions of the meeting or the requests of the meeting and share as asked and that they also reveal themselves in their sharing that I went through a period where I talked at people and I would educate them about AA and that was never received but when I share about my own experience share about how I stay sober and what my personal experience is then everybody tends to listen and, and the meeting flows a lot better so um my thoughts on sponsorship is that when we focus on our purpose for being there, you know, to carry the message of recovery, then everything a lot smoother. I don't, you know, previous comments about running astray is when I got sober, they taught me how to share. And you're supposed to pick people that bring the meeting back into line with the topic. You call on it. And Ashland's pretty free flowing in that it they don't really call on people, so that's been uh, that's been a challenge. For me. I think that's all I have. Thanks, Alan. Kelly, um, so I'm just going to uh, receive the question about any procedures that your groups have in place right now during this new AA normal um, about sponsoring new members, and has this changed at all since COVID nineteen? And how about you personally with sponsorship and guiding others through the 12 steps during this time of social distancing? How are you working with other alcoholics between meetings? Um, Kelly Alcoholic. First of all, I already kind of blew it. Um, when I was talking about my home group, we are meeting through Zoom, and I did not mention that. I just mentioned where we will be when we're back to normal. But we have been meeting um, through Zoom uh, every Monday night at 6.30. Um, you know, sponsorship for me, and, and you talked about um, reaching out to the newcomer and what sponsorship does particularly for our meetings. Um, you know, for me, that was with my first sponsor. Um, you know, she's, she's the one that got me um, to get a home group, and um, she got me to reach my hand out to... Um, people that were even newer than me and to introduce myself and um uh when we are meeting in person my home group has a um we usually have a, a woman for the women and a man for the man um for the men um when we have we ask for people who have under 30 days sobriety um that first the, the woman will send around a phone list and they'll get um, women's phone numbers, and then they'll go up and um, talk to the newcomer um, who introduced themselves. Um, and so that's that's a way that we, we try to welcome the newcomer. Um, and as far as, you know, right now, I'm really just keeping in contact with sponsees through the phone. Um, I don't um, currently, I currently have, only one sponsee who is going through the book and she's working on her fourth step and um, she has completed that um, we can do her fifth step through Zoom um, but other than that um, really just keeping in contact uh, through the phone Great, thank you Fifi um, how about you? What procedures do your groups have in place right now um, during this new normal to sponsor new members? And has any of this changed? And the same thing, anything personally that you, uh, how you've adjusted sponsorship uh, during this time? Uh, Fifi Alcoholic. Um, as I said before, uh, the whole the wall group has a lot of newcomers and it's a very large meeting. So um, we have two newcomer liaisons who introduce themselves at the beginning of the meeting and then stay on afterwards and give out their personal phone numbers so that they're available to anybody who doesn't want to introduce themselves in the meeting. And I love that. And that's what I love about the home group too, because it's really catered to the newcomer and to the primary purpose. Um, you know, the other night I was laying in bed and I had this terrifying thought that what about all the alcoholics who just found 
the willingness to get sober and the courage to get sober, but have, don't have the benefit of having done the work and the steps. Because personally for me, if I hadn't gone through the steps with a sponsor, uh, I, I don't know how I would be faring right now. You know, I'm alone with my thoughts constantly. And that takes me back to my fourth column in my fourth step numerous times a day, thank God, or else I would really just be sitting here full of self-pity and rage and all the other things that are all over um, <clears throat> my sixth and seventh step. So uh, I think it's really important. You know, I have some sponsees. Uh, one of them is still in the middle of the steps. Uh, luckily, she has an inventory and has done a fifth step already, so she has those tools. Um, but I've offered to do, you know, FaceTime and read the book with her if she chooses. Uh, she's very active in AA, so she hasn't seemed to need that. But I stay in touch with all of my sponsees um, somehow, even ones that have moved across the country uh, during this. And it's so important even for me because it keeps me grounded, especially since I'm not one of those people who attends regular Zoom meetings, as I told you, Amy. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I was really tempted to uh, attend a whole bunch of Zoom meetings before this panel so that I sounded really savvy, but I did not. So you've got me at like four meetings under my belt. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay. Hey, um, Garrison, we had a question come in that I want to ask you um, we, from in the Ask It Basket. When do you go from newcomer to sponsor? Yes. When do you go from newcomer to sponsor? Um, Gary's an alcoholic. Um, the steps are in order for a reason, right? Um, I have always, I, I'm very grateful for my first sponsor. I was making amends by four months and raised my hand for sponsorship at six. Um, I hadn't finished my amends, but we had gone through the book and he told me that if I didn't start putting my hand up in, in meetings for sponsorship, uh, he was going to ditch me as as a sponsee, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. And he, he definitely helped save my life. Um, God definitely worked through him to do that. Um, it, sponsorship's an interesting thing. I don't know. If, I'll speak for myself. I don't know if I ever felt qualified to help somebody, um, especially that early on. Um, you know, I feel a little differently today, but, you know, Starting to sponsor people is always kind of a scary, a scary thing. Um, but the guys that I work with, you know, we we go through quick. Um, I I met with a guy today. Um, we did one through four in, in a session, and I got him right in his four step. And I told him he's got two weeks to do it. By the time he's got thirty days, I want him out there sponsoring people because we need that. We need people out there who've had a spiritual experience carrying the message to, to these newcomers. You know, I, I love these Zoom meetings, man. In, in the in the forward to the fourth edition where it talks about modem to modem or face to face, like, you know, the, the literature continues to to surprise, you know. There's stuff in there that you would never know was going to happen like this. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see a story in the fifth or sixth edition about someone who got sober in, in Zoom. Um, so as far as sponsorship... You know, it's another one of those opinions that um, I I don't agree with. You know, you have to have you know, some groups are like you need to wait two years before you start sponsoring someone. Um, where does it say that in the literature? You know, Bill Wilson was on what is on day nine, making amends out there looking for other drugs to work with. Nine days and a spiritual experience to go help other people. Absolutely, work the steps and get out there and give it away. Amen. Thanks, Garrison. Right on. Oh. So um, we had one more question come in, and um, Ryan, I am going to ask you it. Um, the question is, do you feel Facebook Messenger is a safe medium for a sponsor and sponsee to do video chat and step work? Ooh. <laughs> um, my... My anonymity in, 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 in just, uh, it has always been an open book. Um, what necessarily works for me, I, I wouldn't necessarily offer that to somebody else. Um, that's kind of something I think they would have to figure on their own. Um, for me, uh, yeah, um, I, I don't worry about it um, uh, whatsoever. Um, Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, well, that wraps up uh, 
sponsorship. So thank you guys. We are going to move on to the next hot topic, which is newcomers. Okay. So we're going to start with, um, uh, I'm going to pull a little line from the big book that says uh, on uh, Bill's story, page 15, which is in chapter one, and Bill, in the big book it says, Bill wrote, we meet frequently so that newcomers may find the fellowship they seek. Sorry, I'm going to reset this. Yeah. You stop, alarm. Can you guys hear that? Mm-hmm. Hang on. My phone is not being shutting up. There we go. Okay. It's like, Amy, you're talking too long. Okay. So, um, back to newcomers in the quote. Okay, so we meet frequently so that newcomers may find the fellowship they seek. And um, some GSRs reported to us that during this COVID-19 new normal, that meeting attendance regarding new AA members was higher at the beginning of shelter at home versus the current attendance numbers. And so some of the questions that I want to start with are, um, uh, is your group meeting right now so that newcomers may find the fellowship they seek? Or is your group meeting right now to keep its pre-COVID members in connection with the pre-COVID fellowship? Do you guys follow me? Do you follow what I'm saying? Um, is it, is it about the newcomer or is it about keeping the existing members? Um, so I would like to hear from um, Stacy, please. Uh, thanks. <laughs> so, um, again, um, our, so I, this is going to be an opinion, of course. Um, I, I think uh, the purpose of a group meeting should serve both. I, um, so, and I'll use an example like this. I know that there are several new people that traveled with us to do this video format and they are plugging in. It, they, they share that they are plugging in. They feel part of their, it, it's, um, inclusive. And at the same time, I know several, um, members that are not, um, adjusting to this, uh, technology, if you will, and, and they are meeting privately at someone's home. So I, um, I, that, that's a hard one because it's like, it's like building the plane while you're flying. You know, it talks about too, that this is a perfect, this is the flying blind period of this situation. And when I think about all of how the traditions even came to be, if you look at my, like the history of how they came to be, it was because of these huge errors <laughs> in judgment. You know, it's like, let's go public. Let's do this. Let's break our anonymity. You know, all of that stuff kind of happened so that the experience would bring the needed, um, wisdom in order to support the unity of our society. So, um, there you go. Thank you. Thanks, Stacy. So we just had a question come into the ask it basket that says, um, how are groups finding and attracting newcomers to their meetings? And, um, so I'm going to ask, Sal, that question. Sal, how are groups finding and attracting newcomers to their to your meetings? Sal, are you there? Okay, Sal's not there. Okay, yeah, he's, I'm gonna... he's having a challenge. Wait, I'm having challenges. Here he is. I don't know what's Here happening is. with me. Uh... We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. You know, Sal, I got kicked off my own computer or something. I'm not sure. Sal, did you hear the question or do you want me to repeat it? About how we are attracting newcomers? Yes. Um, that's a good question. I, uh, I think mostly by, by attraction. You know, uh, 
our group is pretty much in the AA community, and uh, where I go to meetings, uh, you know, that, it's a hard question to answer. Um, through the central office, um, treatment centers, uh, yeah, that's that's all I know. Thanks, Sal. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to follow up with a, a, a reading from the AA group, from the pamphlet, AA group. It says um, there are a couple of group inventory questions from there that have to do with the newcomer. And um, question number four asks, uh, of this group inventory, suggested group inventory. Do new members stick with us or does turnover seem excessive? If so, why? And what can we do as a group to retain members? And question 10 asks, are we doing all that we can to provide a safe, attractive, and accessible meeting place? Spoiler alert, we're going to be talking about access in a little bit, but this we want to have this pertain to newcomers, okay? So, um, I'd like you to ask yourself these inventory questions about the groups that you attend and that you're a part of, particularly your home groups. So are you and your group members and your current group meeting formats supporting the newcomers who come to your meetings? How so and or how not so? And, um, you know, uh, and then, you know, again, back to those, those inventory questions, you know, is ter does newcomers stick with us? And what can we do to retain members? Or maybe what is it that we're doing that we realize, even if we're sitting here in this meeting right now, realizing, you know what, maybe actually what we're doing with this is is deterring new members. And so um, anyway, I'd like to ask, um, let's ask uh, Alan. So, um, you know, with the COVID stuff, I don't think that... Uh, I'm not aware that we're doing anything to attract new members. I don't know how we would go about it. I think that, uh, you know, it's in my home group when we're meeting face to face, we try to talk to newcomers and encourage them to come back. But um, I'm at a loss for a real answer. So I think that's all I'll say. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> Kelly, I'm going to direct the same question to you. Okay, Kelly, alcoholic. Hey, um, Kelly. We right right before this all happened, actually, our group was talking about doing another group inventory. We did one a few years ago, and we did make some changes in uh, in our group to um, address the newcomer. And um, we we um, you know we one of the things some people said is to make the room all they wanted the room to always look the same when people came in and um and then the like i said we have the the man and the woman um newcomer greeters that, that give them the phone numbers and talk to them um and so who knows what we what we would have come up with and maybe we should do a group inventory over zoom um to um to up our Zoom game here. Um, but as far as newcomers in our Zoom meeting, you know, we still ask if there's anybody under 30 days sobriety. And we and we also say that if, you know, if you want to stick around and talk after, um, you know, we would love to talk to you um, if, if you're a newcomer, if you have any questions, that sort of thing. And, um, uh, and as far as attracting, uh, we are on the District 16 remote Zoom meeting list. Uh, and then I believe that if uh, people call in to the AA hotline, that it goes, um, that they give information to direct people um, to that meeting list is, is how I believe it has been working. So uh, that, that would be the same, you know, if somebody calls... 3 a.m. and um, they need AA, um, there should be somebody to talk to them and, and hopefully to direct them to a meeting. Thanks, Kelly. Garrison. Garrison. Oh, someone's got to unmute Garrison. He keeps muting himself, man. You can't do it. 
tech liaison. Can you please uh, unmute Garrison? Garrison's in the building. I, I, I got a lot of background noise. <laughs> so I, I, I'm going to have to either keep distracted for the rest of the group. Um, as far as topic of attracting newcomers, one of the things that I've been uh, incredibly grateful for, grateful for with the young the young people's community now called Scrumness is that there are a lot of um, secret Facebook pages and, and it's a setting that you do on Facebook to protect people's anonymity um, and there's a ton of young people who, who get here and you know our, our friends who are still drinking see the change in us and they realize they you know they might have this issue as well and so a lot of those people wind up getting connected through Facebook, and we have had a ton of new people get connected that way. I was in a meeting the other night, and uh, this gal uh, brought one of her friends, and it was his very first Zoom meeting ever, and it was a speaker meeting. And at the very end, he, you know, he was like, "This is my first Zoom meeting. Uh, I'm, I'm drinking myself to death. I'm, I'm screwed." I need help, and this this Zoom meeting with 50 people, you know, 12 step this guy. Like I'm I'm in contact with them right now, um, and through these through these Facebook groups, I've seen a lot of people come in um, through that attraction process of, of watching their friends' lives get better, um, and it's it's been a really cool deal to kind of kind of see some of that stuff, um, and it's been a very effective tool um, for getting people sober. Thanks, Garrison. Um, Debbie, I have a question for you. It's something that just came in, um, through the Ask It Basket. Can you please define a newcomer? What is a newcomer? Hmm. Well, I think in general, I have thought of that, and, and obviously this is my opinion, um, and my experience, um, somebody who is new to the, to the, um, process of getting sober, and new to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, either new for the first time, never having been to an AA meeting before, or unable to stay sober for whatever reason, um, and is new to the process of continuous sobriety. Um, I don't know if I've ever put a, a time frame on it. Um, And as I'm kind of talking out loud, um, you know, I, I think until you've worked all the steps, um, you know, that, that might be a, a criteria to, to still be a newcomer. You know, I'm not really sure. I'm kind of talking out loud at, um, about this. But I think the, you know, that 12th step, the culmination of all the steps, um, was really for me when I when it felt like no way. I see you I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and I have a new way of living and I am a part of this now. So, thanks. Thank you, Debbie. That was great. Um, we have a quick question. Um, I have newcomers who won't or cannot use Zoom. Uh, how do I reach out to them to join these meetings? How can I get them into a meeting type setting? And I'm wondering if meeting type setting means uh, just getting them to a meeting. So um, we have a defiant newcomer. Uh, imagine that. Imagine that. Um, Ryan, WWRD, what would Ryan do? <laughs> Uh, once again, you know, I would, uh, I, I would give them my time. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, definitely. I mean, if, if it has to be six feet apart, whatever, I mean, uh, share with them the, the beauty of, in which I've found, um, and, and, uh, and maybe, you know, maybe that will be enough for some enlightenment. Um, uh, maybe, maybe do something different to get different results. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Okay, we are going to close up this hot topic. Garrison's hands up if we have a second. I know, but we have to move on. I'm so sorry. Okay. We're just out of time. I feel like Jimmy Kimmel now. 
with Matt Damon coming on. Okay, I gotta stop. <laughs> gotta stay on topic. Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay, so next hot topic is access. So I'm gonna read um, some uh, a little information from the Access to AA pamphlet. It's on page five, and it says it is difficult for many of us to admit that we have a drinking problem. Yet once over that high hurdle and willing to listen, there are many in AA who face additional personal barriers to accessing the AA message. This pamphlet will acquaint you with the stories of members from a variety of backgrounds who have experienced difficulties when trying to access the AA message and fully participate in our program of recovery. In Alcoholics Anonymous, our desire to stop drinking is our common bond. Since its beginning in 1935, AA's goal has been to reach every alcoholic who needs and wants help. Now, you know, uh, I, I, I was not the writer of this pamphlet, but, uh, I'm sure that it was intended for, you know, uh, other accessibility needs, but now we have this government restriction access to, you know, uh, I, I know, Hey, I'm not going to blame the government. I'm just saying there's something going on. Right. And so there's a block to meeting where the AA message is there. So that's definitely a, uh, an access issue in Alcoholics Anonymous and, so um, it seems like, from what we gathered from our GSR survey, is that there are three like three ways that um, the, the majorities of the groups have gone. One is they decide to make their meeting a remote meeting, video or audio. Two is they're still meeting in person, provided they're in small groups or and then within social distancing guidelines. Or three, they've decided to suspend from meeting at all, therefore canceling the meeting entirely. And, um, you know, so here at District, we've noticed that these rapid meeting changes have really shined a flashlight on three distinct groups of individuals that are experiencing AA accessibility needs in this new normal time. And so um, I'd like to talk about the first group and um, have anyone share their experience, strength, and hope with how we can help this group uh, access the message. Um, the first group is, are people who have concerns about using technology for meetings whether it's financial concerns or personal data concerns. Um, some people literally do not have money to join a, a 60 plus minute phone call or even data with Wi-Fi to connect to a sleep streaming live video conferencing on zoom and others are just absolutely untrusting of technology and compromising their personal information, uh, and anonymity to private tech companies. So, um, many in this category are not going to meetings in person or they're, they're going to meetings in person or which is very, very, very few, or they're not going to meetings at all. So how can groups and individual members accommodate these alcoholics right now, this type with the 12 traditions in mind? So, um, anyone, uh, want to take that one? I'm going to take someone who's not on the panel, but he has experience with this. Ken, can you please share? Yeah, uh, Ken, alcoholic. Hey, Ken. I appreciate uh, the question. Yes, I'm one of the uh, non-tech people, um, and I and I had a problem in, uh, in the beginning uh, with this, but I had to reach out uh, for the help and. and uh, Accepting that uh, this is, if I wanted to, uh, uh, well, I'm supposed to be a, a messenger for the whole of the wall group, uh, the GSR, and I explained that right out out of the gate, uh, being a non-tech person, uh, like tonight, we'll just, uh, so I had trouble getting in, and then I see where you're using a chat room very for the ask it basket my hands are in my lap i tried that at a meeting this morning and i missed half the share because they asked me to get in there and put my name in there uh, to identify myself and uh, it was a little frustrating uh, i finally got it in there but, uh, the tech end of it, uh, we just got to reach out, and uh, there's plenty of people for us to do that. Uh, the phone 
number issue. Uh, I started out on the phone on the dial in and uh, I got refused a number of times for whatever reason uh, when you hit the star six those things I think that's kind of turning uh, people off my observation and, and, and in the workshop I went to uh, at the area again Chuck B Amy A all those folks who jumped on board, Nick J, uh, and it came down to a situation for the meetings, for the meetings to have more dashboard people in there. So if you have a random phone number, uh, you're able to get that in the, the, the hand sign. But to, to answer the uh, uh, question directly, as far as uh, how to get newcomers in or use their phone messages. I think the best thing is what the hole in the wall has done, and that's the liaison. And uh, in the beginning, uh, the liaison ends of it. I hope uh, I haven't talked to our liaisons to see if they've got feedback and if they needed help. I think it's us that needs to come forward and say, hey, I'll just, I don't think he'll mind, uh, and say, hey, Mitch, did you get some uh, people? Can I help? Can I go out? Mitch, Mitch, Mitch has got a full-time job. And I think those are the things that we need to do to help go out. Uh, the uh, past delegate in the GSR school said the group, is the web that goes out in to where the basically the drunks are the alcoholics are and then we all kind of grab together the district the area with that information that comes flowing back in and they're there to help us so that's kind of where i'm at i've learned a lot I'll continue to get learned. Uh, I've made a lot, a lot of mistakes trying to uh, do multimedia. I've got, a, I've got my ears burned a couple of times. Uh, You're doing great, Ken. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry, okay. I just pulled you. I just pulled you out on here. I, I, uh, I apologize okay. for that, that's but great. you did awesome. Thank you. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Appreciate it. So. Um, uh, the, the original group that I was just talking about are the, you know, the group, um, that we want to make sure can access meetings are the ones with financial concerns and personal data concerns. And, uh, I'm going to move to the next group just in the interest of time. Um, and the second group are alcoholics in Southern Oregon who are resistant to technology. What, what Ken Jay was just saying, um, because, uh, Maybe they feel like they're not tech people. And from our GSR survey, we found that, you know, many in this category are likely not to have computers nor smartphones. Um, or they might just be simply unwilling to try and learn how to connect with the remote meetings. And um, again, in, in this category, uh, many that some are going to meetings in person or they're not going to meetings at all. And how can groups and individual AA members accommodate these alcoholics right now? Um, and... Um, you know, it might take, you know, some time for the, for the, uh, the gathering restrictions to be lifted. So, um, I am going to ask, uh, so this, again, this is all about access and accommodating. I'm going to ask, um, let me ask Kelly. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, we're talking about access, uh, yeah. to meetings and, um, the first group of that we're, that we, we, we realized that um, we're having trouble accessing are people who have financial concerns and personal data concerns to connect with um, these online meetings. And so you can you can talk about that if you want, how we can how we can accommodate them or what we can try to do. And then the second group are people who are resistant to technology because they feel like they're just not tech people. Um, maybe they don't have smartphones or you know or computers um, and uh, and 
and but maybe they have them, but they're just unwilling to try and learn. So, um, and again, there's just a limited amount of meetings that are meeting in person. So how can we accommodate these groups? I honest, I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I, the only thing I can say is, is if we know of somebody that is in a financial position, um, if we can help them to come up with, um, with a solution to that and, you know, whether that's, you know, I don't know, uh, loaning them a device that they can use. I, I, I honestly don't know how, how that, I mean, if, if, if I had a friend that came to me with that, I would, I would try to help them figure it out. Um, and as far, as far as the tech stuff goes, I can only relate it to, um, me helping my mom with stuff, you know, I, I wasn't able to see her for a good while. She's not in the program, but just as an example, I wasn't able to see her because, um, you know, she's a very compromised person and, and normally that kind of stuff I help her with in person. It's much easier to, to do that than trying to do it over the phone. Um, trying to tell somebody how to get online and do those things over the phone is, is a lot more difficult. Um, but again, I mean, I think that's all, I mean, knowing who these people are, I think, I think is the, would be the biggest question because if they're not attending the meeting, um, how, how do we know that they're out there unless, unless we're talking to them? Um, so I didn't give you an answer at all. No, no, you, you did. We're just, we're, you know, it's, this is all challenging stuff. That's why we're talking about it. We're not talking about the easy things. We're talking about the real things that are happening that we don't necessarily have answers to. So thank you. Um, you know, the third group that um, we identified from, again, the GSR survey and discussing is um, in Southern Oregon for alcoholics who are in the, you know, quote, elderly bracket or in assisted living facilities or those members who are living with serious underlying health conditions. You know, they too have been deemed by the government to be high risk for contracting the virus. And, you know, obviously, therefore, much less inclined to go to an in-person meeting for a very long time. Um, you know, they might be tech savvy, they might not. But, um, you know, there's concern about what's going to happen with folks that are in this bracket as our meetings do, you know, restrictions get lifted and meetings move to in-person. Um, how do we feel that groups and individual AA members can accommodate these alcoholics with the 12 traditions in mind? And um, I'm going to ask uh, Debbie that question. Um, actually, it's funny. One of the things that I've been wondering as you know, this resolves whenever that is, um, was if the Zoom meetings will continue at, at some level. Um, and I really hope so, just for that reason. I don't know what that would look like, but I think, and there might have to be some sort of outreach program. And, and again, you know, similar to, to Kelly, I'm not sure what that looks like. But I think the Zoom meetings have actually opened up uh, accessibility if, if we can pass the technological challenges to a whole population in Alcoholics Anonymous that has probably been underserved all along and that's the ones with um, some sort of limitation. So my, my hope is um, that on some level the remote meetings will continue and and maybe there'll be, you know, more tutorials and a, a new service position created, you know, for um, Zoom tutorials for for people that aren't really familiar with technology. That would be my hope, anyway. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much, Debbie. Appreciate it. Okay, guys, we are going to move on to the next hot topic: safety. And um, we are a little bit behind schedule. So just letting note to viewers, note to panelists, but we're going to be okay. It's going to be fine. Um, but I want to make sure that we get to both of these, uh, the last topics, uh, safety and um, uh, self-supporting. So safety, 
Um, tradition one, the long form, says each member of Alcoholics Anonymous is but a small part of the great whole. AA must continue to live or most of us will surely die. Hence, our common welfare comes first, but individual we- welfare follows close afterward. Keeping meetings safe for any alcoholic who has a drinking problem and wants to stop is a key component of Tradition 1 because it affects our common welfare. So let's dive in a little bit deeper uh, into safety and AA. And I'm going to read another statement that's published from our General Service Office in New York. And it says, AA groups are spiritual entities made up of alcoholics who gather for the sole purpose of staying sober and helping other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Yet we are not immune to the difficulties that affect the rest of humanity. Alcoholics Anonymous is a microcosm of the larger society within which we exist. Problems found in the outside world can also make their way into the rooms of AA. As we strive to share in a spirit of trust, both at meetings and individuality with sponsors and friends, it is reasonable for each member to expect a meaningful level of safety. Those attending AA meetings derive a benefit by providing a safe environment in which alcoholics can focus on gaining and maintaining sobriety. The group can then fulfill its primary purpose to carry the the AA message to the alcoholic who still suffers. For this reason, groups and members discuss the topic of safety. So let's talk about workable solutions to help keep our meetings safe based on the fundamental principles of the fellowship. And um, so, I mean, obviously there are many safety issues tied into remote meeting um, that have come up, like Zoom bombing and Zoom and other ill-intended people joining meetings on other tech platforms. And so... um, Without getting too much into the weeds, um, too technical, but I think it's important to address here, what steps are your groups taking to make sure that your remote meetings are accessible but still safe? And um, just curious, just so other people can relate, are these steps in place because of discussions that you had in advance to prevent safety issues, or were these steps put in place as the result of response because some safety issues have been overlooked? And how have you also... If something has happened, have you remedied a safety issue on the fly? So, um, I am going to start with um, Garrison. Garrison, I'm Bog. Um, I, I have not been in any meetings. I have been too involved. Um, we have not had any issues with that, so I don't know if I have experience to share on that as far as the accessibility thing you know, before I had mentioned the, the Facebook pages and there's a ton of um, Facebook pages going up um, you see some of the big ones with like 20,000 people on uh, some of these worldwide ones you know zoom into the fourth dimension um, a zoom updates you know there's there's local pages like this um, most meetings now are passworded um, so that it, it decreases Things like I said, I, I haven't heard from a meeting that's that's had that. I've heard about it. Um, I know it's an issue in, in some places more than others, but as far as accessibility, um, I, I've seen a, a big increase actually. Um, and you know, as long as people are willing to go to any links for their sobriety, like they're they're gonna get in here. Period. It's, it's we, we have to keep an attitude of honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. You know, I, I didn't like doing these Zoom meetings at first myself, and I belong to the young people bracket. You know, and I'm not even super technologically advanced with my computer screen. So that's how old it is. It's real slow like that. <laughs> um, so, you know, once you're willing to make sure you're doing what you need to do for your recovery, like, we'll get here. That's my experience. Thanks. Thanks, Garrison. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Ryan the question about, um, you know, how uh, what steps are your groups taking to make sure remote meetings are accessible but still safe? Um, and what are some steps uh, in place because of discussions you had in advance to prevent safety issues uh, and that kind of stuff? So... Share your experience with us. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Amy. Uh, so I, I'm, I've been granted the, the the beauty of having a sponsor that's extremely uh, involved in service. Um, 
So uh, the minute I showed him any sort of initiative to, to want to put uh, our meeting on Zoom, um, he um, gave me, he basically had sent me a, a format of, of, of keeping the safety, you know, uh, password protected. Um, you know, it basically turned into a little bit of a control freak, you know, uh, when you're running a Zoom meeting. I mean, uh, you know, people pop on that, that have their last name, you change it. Um, you know, if somebody pops on and, and it's just a phone number, you know, I've, I've stopped the meeting, asked them to introduce themselves. I mean, I've kind of been a little bit of a, a control freak when it comes to it because we're dealing with people's anonymity here, you know, and keeping that safe. Uh, my sponsor even gave me a, a little format to read uh, along with my normal meetings format um, to, uh, to keep all that safe. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's basically it. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Ryan. So, um, something else with, with safety, um, before we should, we shift on to the, the final topic, um, you know, is, uh, some meetings, you know, are still meeting in person right now. And as the state mandates get lifted, uh, I think, you know, more is going to be coming out this next week as far as the plan with that, uh, that more groups will most likely, you know, at some point, resume to meeting in person in some way, some capacity. And, um, you know, what are some suggestions to keep your, your group members safe, safe from COVID-19? I know we're not all doctors and nurses and stuff, but um, uh, I'd love to just get your um, thoughts on that, Sal. Um, like I said, uh, I this morning I was at a meeting and uh, there was eight of us there and uh, we kept our distance and when it came time for prayer and all that we still kept our distance and you know it was great you know I'm surprised that we don't have more uh, of those meetings uh, meeting in parking lots because um, I think you can honor the the state's request of social distancing and still have meetings um, um, so yeah and uh, yeah, that's all I got. Thanks, Sal. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to the next the final topic, uh, hot topic. Self supporting. So, uh, in the seventh tradition, states every AA group ought to be fully self supporting, declining outside contributions, and there's a pamphlet called. Uh, where money and spirituality mix, and I want to read a, an excerpt from it. Um, on page five, it, it explains the importance of this tradition, starting from the group, by explaining, it says this, self-support begins with me because I'm a part of us, the group. We pay our rent and utility bills, buy coffee, snacks, and AA literature. We support our central office, our area committee, and our general service office. If we're not for those entities, Many new people would never discover the miracles of AA. And then on page 11 in that same pamphlet, under the question and answers section about AA finances, there's this interesting question that's posed, which I'm sure we can all relate to. It says, question, my group doesn't have a lot of money. Is it better to not send anything at all until we can afford to make a sizable contribution? And the answer, in the spirit of participation, no contribution toward carrying the message can be too small. Bill W. spoke about our collective obligation to support AA services. And if everyone waited until they had a sizable amount, it's more likely that AA's bills would go unpaid. So, um, and again, I know we mentioned this earlier, but the, there's this pamphlet called the AA group and it has some um, prospective group inventory questions. And in that it says um, on page 29, the last question asks the reader, how is our group fulfilling its responsibility to the seventh tradition? So um, what I'd like to do is bring this seventh tradition talk to um, what we're experiencing today. You know, because of the meeting changes, because of COVID-19, it seems that many groups here in Southern Oregon, you know, we're not paying rent, we're not buying coffee, we're not buying creamer, we're not, you know, buying literature or chips and that kind of stuff because most meetings have moved to a remote meeting setting. So there aren't expenses. And so it seems from the GSR survey that we had that, um, so many groups aren't passing the basket in meetings. I mean, obviously, you know, it's different, you know, if you're meeting remotely and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, 
we're not sure if that's because of the feeling of, hey, we have close to zero expenses, so we don't need to be collecting any money from our members, or it might be for the fear of not being able to keep the social distancing or fear of technology, of collecting technologically. So what I'd like to do is um, ask you to consider how do you feel your group is fulfilling its responsibility to the seventh tradition right now during this new AA normal? And um, how do you feel that, that you can be doing a better job as an individual? Um, and what's something that you can bring back to your home group to discuss um, about the seventh tradition? So um, I'd like to uh, hear from Fifi. My name is Fifi. I'm still an alcoholic. Hey. Uh, so the hole in the wall, uh, they were giving announcements about sending a check in for the seventh tradition, but just today or yesterday, we set up a Venmo account. So that's an option. Um, and I understand that there are a lot of people that have the opinion that they don't need to give money because the format has changed and that and the necessity isn't there, but we don't know how um, we're going to grow in this. I mean, we're witnessing a monumental change to history, really, um, in AA right now. And it, it's beautiful to watch everybody kind of scramble and try to make it work. And, and all of these questions that you're posing, Amy, I mean, it, it, they're so important. And I, it's going to be wonderful to see how, where, and Debbie, how you talked about the underserved group that has existed probably all along. I mean, it's really bringing up some questions that I think should have been asked before we were to answer them. Um, but as far as being self-supporting, I think that, you know, I think if we're able to, we still need to give because we don't know what challenges are lying ahead for us and what solutions are going to be put in place to, um, you know, to, to solve those problems. Thanks, Phoebe. Alan. Well, um, for me, I mean, my has changed. Okay. Uh, for me, I... I look at it as that most of the money we send to area and district is used in travel. And that with all this travel, we kind of say, well, we don't need to send them that money. But I think GSO is in, in critical need of money now, and they probably will come up with more suggestions and opportunities for us to, to be better at doing the Venmo and, and the Zoom stuff because they're representing the whole group. And um, I don't know, my group set up a Venmo account, and uh, I don't think we've uh, received anything. But uh, just as a member of AA, I think it's important that we don't forget to send money to GSO. Thanks, Alan. Garrison. Garrison, thank you for plugging that. Um, I had heard through the grapevine that GSO was down to like a nine month group reserve for, for its office and or something like that. And it's been super critical. Uh, my home group has been sending all of our seven tradition to GSO directly. Um, and, and granted, you know, we're not spending money on rent or this or that. Like there are still expenses. We still have literature to print. We still have literature to get out. Um, it, it, it's my opinion that the literature is the most important thing that we have going in this program as well. It's only for sponsorship. And so to keep the funds going into that so that our organization can stay running is, is absolutely critical. Um, Venmo is super easy to set up if you have a treasurer who wants to protect their anonymity and doesn't want to be involved with the bank. Have another trusted servant do it. It's, it's really easy. Thanks, Garrison. Uh, Stacy, how do you feel your group's fulfilling its responsibility to seventh tradition right now? Um, we have two methods. We have the Venmo account, uh, which is posted during our, um, uh, when we make a, when we read it in our format. And then we also list our treasurer's personal address so that you may mail them a personal check. So, um, and at our business meeting this morning, and I'll try to quote him. He said that right now our, our numbers are a little bit of a moving target. Um, but he, it's his understanding. He, he feels that we're about, um, 30% down in contributions. So how are we, uh, and, I, and I know I used to be the treasurer of that meeting and, um, um, I felt, I believe that part of 
the greatest service that we did was the quarterly um, disperse, disbursements um, because um, how that connects us with the world of Alcoholics Anonymous because it 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 it, 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 it bridges that gap. It connects us to the world. So, and we were able to do that, but we still make those distributions. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, Debbie, you have your hand up. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> okay, Kelly, would you like to um, close us out on this topic? Sure. So, um, our my meeting does have a Venmo account. We looked at Venmo and PayPal, and um, the person that was researching it found that the Venmo. Um, asked for a little less information, I think, than the PayPal. So that's why we went with that one. Um, our, my group also has a three-month prudent reserve, so we will be fine. And we have voted at our last business meeting to continue to pay to pay our bills. And, and one of those bills is our, um, you know, our contributions that we, that we make. And, um, we do, when we get up to a certain amount, that's when we make those distributions. And so it's, we don't do it on a, on a real regular basis, but, um, our next business meeting is this Monday and I'm sure that we'll be discussing that, um, those contributions that are made. And I also know, I don't know the number, but, um, I do know that, that they say if every single person in AA sent GSO like $7 or something like that, it's something pretty low, maybe somebody else can remember that specific number, that they would be fully self-supporting. And so I know what we can do as individuals is send some money to GSO, um, just send it straight to GSO. And, and, and like you read in the pamphlet, it doesn't have to be a lot. I think um, if a lot of people send in a little bit of money, it, it can make a huge difference. Thank you, Kelly. Appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to make a quick note. One thing it didn't say in the pamphlet, um, but uh, is important because it affects us uh, here locally, is that we have a central office, too. And so distributions... Um, you know, are often in that pamphlet. It talks about distributions to our local central office as well. Um, and it wasn't in the thing that I read, so that's why I just wanted to put a plug in there for our central office because they have a brick and mortar rent to pay, right? So, um, okay, well, we talked about a lot of things tonight, did we not? And so, um, you know, while we're all adjusting to this new AA normal, let's wrap up the night by talking about a very, very important thing that was created by the Middleton Group in 1946. <laughs> Rule 62. Don't take yourself too damn seriously. And it says in the 12 and 12, which is where we learn about Rule 62, that thus it was under Tradition 4, an AA group had exercised its right to be wrong. Moreover, it had performed a great service for Alcoholics Anonymous because it had been humbly willing to apply the lessons it learned. So, as we leave this event and go out into the world during this new AA normal, let's all be sure we're not straying, straying from Rule 62. And on that note, that's a wrap. Thank you, panelists. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.